Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to all of you who are joining us, whether from the East Coast or the West Coast, or anywhere in between the two left coasts of the United States of America. Uh, it is our pleasure to have this presentation as far as the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, another one of our lecture series and speaker series for the Fresno State PBBI for 2022. We're very happy to have with us uh, a uh, friend of ours and a friend of the Portuguese American community, a wonderful uh, poet uh, that uh, has uh, written extensively about the Portuguese American experience, about his own experience, about his own roots, has done translation work, and um, we're going to have a conversation, but mostly we're going to talk about his book, and we're going to uh, have some readings from his book as well. Thanks to those of you who are following us on Facebook Live and other all the different groups that have agreed to carry us as uh, live as well on their pages and their groups. We appreciate it very, very much. Our guest is uh, the poet Scott Edward Anderson, uh, who is uh, lives in the East Coast of the United States of America and has been present at many things that we have done with PBBI. We thank him for always collaborating with us and always being able to and 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 ready to uh, at the last minute uh, come and be our guest in the Portuguese American Hour or many of the events that we have done in the last uh, three years. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on uh, the new book. Here it is. Thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, I know that uh, many of uh, the folks following us uh, have uh, seen you and have heard you, uh, but if you don't mind uh, telling us a little bit of a brief bio about uh, uh, who is Scott Edward Anderson for those who have not uh, heard of you before, which in the Portuguese American community shouldn't be too many, but there. Are some. <laughs> yes, uh, I've, been, I've been pretty pretty active in the Portuguese American community over the last few years, and uh, um, that's not not by accident. That's by by design. Um, I've uh, I spent most of my my, my life, my, most of my fifty eight years, um, not being very much aware of my Azorian Portuguese background. Uh, of course, I was I, I I knew about it, but I didn't know much. Uh, of the of the actual history, and so I've been on a journey over the past um, five years or so to really try to uncover my roots uh, in the Azores and also in in Portugal on the mainland, and um, it's been an incredible journey. And um, I've had a lot of help along the way. Um, folks like yourself and and, and others have been encouraging me. Um, and uh, although I was I was born in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and, um, and grew up in, in East Providence in the Portuguese, Amer right in the Portuguese American enclave. But my grandfather, for those of you who haven't heard the story before, was born in 1915 in Providence uh, to uh, immigrants from, uh, fr from, from San Miguel. And um, he didn't want to be, he didn't want to be Portuguese. He wanted to be American. And so he really cut ties with um, uh, with the Portuguese American community, he didn't speak Portuguese at home. Consequently, my m mother never learned it, and I never uh, learned it as a, as a growing up. Um, he only spoke Portuguese with with his parents, and uh, so it's really been for me a journey of of discovery and uh, uncovering um, not only the 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 data, the history, the um, you know the facts, but really the sensibility and what it contributes to who I am. So that's very, very important. So very happy to be here and always happy to, uh, to participate uh, with PBBI and, uh, and, and other Portuguese American organizations. So Scott, a little bit about your poetry. When did, um, when did poetry begin? I, if I recall correct, I think it began in school um, at a very young age, but um, uh, when, uh, tell us a little bit when it, when, when it began and, and when did you say, I'd like to do more of this? I mean, sometimes, right. you know, in school right. people, you know, we, 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 we write a poem and, uh, or we write, you know, an essay or we write something and we kind of like that, but then we go into other things and, sure. and it never happens. But with you, so tell us a little bit about that trajectory, please. Yeah. So I, I uh, grew up, I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor um, when I was very young, the formative years of my life, Gladys Taylor. I've, I've spoken about many times and have written about her as well. Um, one of the poems actually in Wine, it's in Wine Dark Sea, it was in my first book, Fell Field. And um, she really 
I always say that um, sort of like everything you, everything I know I learned in kindergarten. Well, everything I know I learned from Gladys Taylor. So uh, I can I can trace almost all of my interests in in the world in one shape or another to Gladys Taylor and to her early influence on me. Um, everything from nature to uh, poetry, art, music, and um, and sports. And so it was, um, it was quite, quite an experience. She would recite Robert Burns in, in her living room. We, we, we shared a house with, uh, with her and her companion, um, like I said, when I was very young, and then also their summer home up in Vermont. So I had a, a really a lot of exposure early on to whatever Gladys wanted to teach me. And I was a sponge. Uh, around Gladys and everything that uh, I soaked it all up. So um, she really got me interested in poetry, her passion for it and her ability to just conjure it and embody it was was phenomenal. And I and and I thought, well, this is this is something I want I, I want to learn more about. I really started writing poetry when I was about nine, not very good poetry. I wrote a uh, kind of an epic poem about my another one of my great grandfathers who was not Portuguese, but had had been to the Azores, as it turns out, he was a whaler. And I wrote uh, kind of a rhyme of the ancient mariner about about uh, uh, Grandpa Burgess. And um, thankfully, that has not surfaced. And I don't think it's in any boxes that I kept, um, because it was probably really horrible. <laughs> but when I was a teenager, um, I really, um, you know, I think, I had turned to music at one point because that was, you know, it was the age, it was the seventies and it was, you know, a time when, when music and singing singer songwriters were big and uh, you know, Bob Dylan was a big influence and, and others. And, but what I found from Bob Dylan was that he would reference poets uh, that he had read and he was interested in. So that led me to reading Arthur Rimbaud and Ezra Pound and all of these, you know, incredible poets that, that he would reference. And so really around, around about the age of 15, I started getting serious about it. And I had two teachers, uh, two English teachers in my high school who encouraged me. And one of them published my first poem. Um, thankfully that hasn't surfaced either. <laughs> my first poem at publication, but uh, they would sort of be like a, an early kind of Amazon alg algorithm. You like this book? Here, try this book. You know, you like this poet? Try this poet. And it was sort of a really, it really gave me a broad and 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 deep knowledge of, of poetry and fueled that passion, continued to add fuel to that fire. We'll talk a little bit about all of uh, the various books that you've published, but uh, let's um, let's uh, focus on on uh, wine uh, wine dark sea uh, and. Um, and uh, you have, um, of course, in the back cover, one of the, and I'd like to quote um, one, of, one of the folks who wrote um, about the book, and it says, Anderson's lyric themes are timeless, myth, romantic, love, nature, and our search for meaning in the quotidian, but his touch is light. He takes fully to the heart Frost's proposition that a poem, again, a quote, begins in delight and ends in wisdom making this rich, new, and selected both deeply pleasurable and instructive. Um, the opening, a poem alone, is intoxicating and evocative. And Kathy, I uh, hope I can pronounce the last name. You'll help me. Is it uh, Fagan? Fagan, Kathy Fagan. Kathy yeah. Fagan. Yeah, um, poet. Her, her book, Sycamore, is one of, my, one of my favorites for the last decade. It's really well, a phenomenal I, I, book. I, I need to discover it. And um, But um, I just wanted to start with that. The generous opening, a poem alone, is intoxicating and, and evocative. And I and I think uh, when we did a, a small segment on the Portuguese American Hour uh, uh, to as kind of a preface to this, um, I, I talked about it and I and I said how rich it was. And and you talked about how um, you know how of course mythology has been part of uh, of, uh, of of your work. Um, I actually think that that poem enough is enough for someone to do a master's thesis. Um, I, and I'm not joking. I, I've, I've seen master theses is done on work that's not as, uh, as deep as that is. So um, tell us a little bit of what drives you into to, or what drove you into this poem. Um, it is a generous poem. It is intoxicating. 
it is pr provocative it is evocative it is um it's very I, i've read it three times and every time i've read it i've discovered something new and that's mm. what good poetry does mm. so uh what led you to write this poem and give it the title of the book yeah so the title poem really came about um for a couple of reasons one because um i i had been reading a uh, new translation of Homer's Odyssey, and Homer's Odyssey is one of the, it's, it is one of my all-time favorite, favorite books, my all-time favorite poems. Um, I've read probably every translation, uh, at least every translation that I can find, and um, this latest translation by Emily Wilson, which is absolutely phenomenal, um, is the most, it's the freshest, most um, contemporary take on, on the poem. And it has, I'd say it's pretty much surpassed my all-time favorite, uh, which was Robert Fagel's translation, uh, which came out in the early, uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And um, so I've been reading that and I was, I was um, really thinking a lot about, about the Odyssey. Of course, I had referenced the Odyssey in my, in my book length poem, Azorian Suite. And I was on my own Odyssey, rediscovering my home and homeland. And um, I, this phrase, wine dark sea, which comes up again and again and again in both the Odyssey and in the Iliad, um, as well as other works as well, it just struck me. I kept thinking about it. What does it mean? What does wine dark sea mean? Um, and then I started to unpack it a little bit, do some research, uh, trying, to, trying to uncover what the origins were. And had some fascinating origins, um, both the, the phrase and then why it became popular. And then almost everybody who's translated the book has, has used the phrase. And, and I, I don't know that too many of them have really thought about it. Um, Emily Wilson had thought about it and she was tweeting a few things about it um, when, she, when she was talking about her, her translation. And so it was this combination of, of, of deep dive into the Odyssey, and in particular, this one phrase that's just stuck in my head, and I couldn't couldn't get my arms around it. I really need to try to understand it, and and then because it was the pandemic, and we were stuck at home, um, you know, I started thinking about the juxtaposition of that. You know, sort of this the Odyssey is all about the you know Odysseus's journey home and trying to get home, and being thwarted at every turn, and yet. Here we were having to stay at home, <laughs> you know, perhaps dreaming about going somewhere else like the Azores or wherever. And, and that kind of um, struck me as well. And, and that, of course, led me to thinking about some of the, some of the, uh, some of the issues around the pandemic and, and some of the, uh, uh, well, a, a whole, se whole section about, about um, the, um, uh, cruise ship industry, which continually continued to operate during the pandemic, uh, at least in the early stages, and um, was fraught with all sorts of problems and issues, and uh, and people were kind of trapped at sea for a long period of time, couldn't come ashore. Um, you know, guests would leave, and the staff would have to stay behind, and it was really quite a mess. So um, all of those things kind of came together, um, and. Um, ultimately uh, ended up in this, in, the, in this poem. Indeed, you, um, you just positioned, uh, uh, of course, uh, Homer's Odyssey with, uh, with, uh, with the Odyssey of our everyday lives and, and some things that might mean nothing to someone, you know, because we just go on uh, kind of mechanically uh, living our lives. Uh, and yet you brought this great piece of literature into everyday, uh, everyday occurrences, uh, that, uh, that sometimes, as I said, are meaningless to us, but, uh, but they all, they all have a purpose or they have a reason or they, uh, or they all exist because of something. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. was this, a was this a long process on this, uh, uh, it, it's a lengthy poem, but it's a beautiful poem. And I, as I said, you know, was this a, a, a lengthy process for you with this poem? Yeah, yeah, it really was. I mean, I, I had started to noodle around with some of the language in there and, um, and the form kind of took shape. And it's a very unusual form for me because it's sort of, um, uh, it mixes uh, kind of a documentary style, mm -hmm, if you will, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, take, mm -hmm. taking from news accounts and, and from uh, some, some historical uh, documents. 
um, mixed with personal as well. So a whole section in the poem about my great grandparents keep coming back to that, you know, and, and their journey across the Atlantic and thinking about Atlantic crossings and thinking about being at sea and thinking about trying to trying to get from one place to another, trying to get home, um, which is kind of an obsession of mine um, in my work. So, yeah. Indeed. And so um, besides that poem, of course, the, the book is divided into different sections and you have one on transitions we'll talk about. But uh, do you mind uh, 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 sharing with us one of the poems from the book? Uh, I know uh, we talked about the possibility of you reading a few of them. So if you don't mind, we'd start yeah. with one and then and we could talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, um, maybe what I'll do is um, maybe I can start with just the opening of Wine Dark Sea, oh, that'd just be to give, since we've been talking about it so much, sure. um, I'm just, I'll just take a little bit from that. And um, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll, re I'll, I'll read sections of it. So um, start with that. Wine Dark Sea. To the retired classicist watching a vivid sunset at the mouth of Maine's Daramascata River, the color of sea resembles Mavrodaphne, a wine of deep purple brown hue, made from a black grape indigenous to the northern Peloponnesus. The upper reaches of sky filled with ash from the eruption of Mount St. Helens over 3,000 miles away, cast a deep red on the outgoing tide, river of many fishes. Perhaps Homer's wine dark sea is ashy sunset red. And um, I should mention that um, that uh, river of many fishes is actually the, the translation of the, the Indian name for the Dharamaskata River. Um, so so there's, there's all sorts of things going on in there. But one of the things that really struck me was that in all the research I did on this phrase, um, it kept coming back people kept talking about the, that the Greeks couldn't see the color blue. So when they looked at the ocean, what color were they seeing? Now, if, if the translation of oinops pontus is, is oinus meaning wine, ops meaning face and pontus meaning sea. So basically it's wine's face sea. And what does that mean? <laughs> so I started thinking about, well, all of these things. And so, Another little section of this poem is about, well, I'll just read it. Some theorize the ancient Greeks could not see the color blue, their optical palette limited to black and white and possibly red. Such cultural blindness cannot be proved. Their experience of color may have consisted rather of equal parts movement and shimmer. Porphyrios, that glimmer effect on sea surface when light refracts or reflects at different hours and in different weathers. Wine's tint recalling the luster of liquid inside the terracotta cups used to drink it. So there's a lot of that in the poem where I'm going back to interpretations of what this phrase might mean. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I think well, I shouldn't, no spoiler alert. We won't give a spoiler alert, but um, <laughs> I kind of go into um, at the end, this sort of scientific uh, um, explanation of what they may have been seeing and, um, and what, what the phrase may actually have been intended uh, to, to evoke. But I'll leave it at that, so, you know. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, we don't. We want people to discover it and to rediscover and rediscover that poem. Because if uh, if you uh, purchase the book, as we hope all of you will, um, and um, and when you're and when you're reading the book, you know, um, you may read it uh, uh, just uh, uh, rather rapidly. Let's put it that way. And it's a poem to be reread and reread and actually taken in in in. in um, in, in, in different portions. That's how, how I, I reread it twice. Um, Derek Sheffield, someone, another author who uh, also, a friend of yours who also wrote about the book, said the history, literature, science, and philosophy 
that layer these poems make this collection a rich and beautiful invitation to consider how our own sense of place and identity informs our relationship with the living world. And I think that's a perfect, um, uh, a perfect interpretation because throughout your poems, as you said, the idea of home, um, and you also said, and you talked about the about uh, Mother Nature and about um, and about the land and about the the the, the natives to those lands. And so um, in your poetry, there's lots of incorporation of, of history, of lits, of science, of philosophy, um, and, and, and sometimes for us to consider who we are and how, and how our identity is informed, because exactly as you, as you put, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a couple of, in many of the poems throughout, I mean, we are, and, and your poetry shows that we are Although you're Azorian and you also have Scottish and other and other ethnicities as well, uh, but all of these together form and inform who we are today. But always, there's always a special place in your poetry for Mother Nature. Mm, yeah. Am yeah. I wrong? <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And that came from Gladys Taylor. She used to take me out when I was a small child, and and um, we'd crawl around in the grass and we'd dig up uh, you know clods of dirt and bring it back and run it through a Burley's funnel and look at the the nematodes and the and the tiny microscopic uh, you know um, be, uh, creatures that would would come out and um, she used to take take me out and make me make me match the uh, acorns to the leaves and the trees and where did we see this tree and where did we you know what did it look like what was the bark like and so lots of like paying attention and and getting me to understand. Not, not just the naming of things, but but their significance and sort of, you know, to be aware. So now, I mean, a day doesn't go by. I mean, this afternoon, my wife and I took a, took a walk uh, in the woods and, you know, I was, I was, uh, I saw a, a, a nuthatch on the tree and, I, you know, I know the first time I saw a nuthatch was when Gladys pointed it out to me and I was like, well, why, why is that bird upside down? On the tree, and she explained the whole thing. You know, <laughs> I go into it in great detail. So now, whenever I, I'm out in the woods, there, there isn't a moment that goes by when I'm not thinking of Gladys and sort of like my education as a as a young uh, young person, um, which which was phenomenal. And I, uh, it, it's really I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to her. She's no longer with us, but um, I'm sure she's somewhere uh, watching. The uh, so the the nature and 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 the woods and the sea and everything uh, all of these all of these elements are very important to your to your to your to your to your poetry. Do you um, in your poetry? Do you uh, because you also incorporate as 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 was said there by Derek uh, history and uh, other forms of literature uh, as you just pointed out by the the, the opening poem. Um, do you do you do you look at, uh, at at a poem as a way to uh, you know uh, there's it's been said um, that um, I'm a writer not to save the world but sometimes to try to save myself and so do we uh, <laughs> yeah. do you do you do you think that there's a, a mixture of you know I'm not here to save the world I'm here to save myself. do you think there's a mixture to, for to bring you closer to these things that you were taught by Gladys and and that your lifelong experiences have, have brought up on you yeah I know no question no question I think um yeah I mean sometimes I've, I I I'd love to be able to save the world um, I tried. I tried it for a while working with the Nature Conservancy. Um, which maybe we saved a little bit of it, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're sometimes our own worst enemy as a species. So uh, makes makes the battle incredibly difficult. But um, but yeah, it's very important to me uh, the natural world and being in the natural world and experiencing it. Um, I think from from the perspective of poetry, um, one of my teachers, uh, Gary Snyder. Uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase what he said, but it was basically that um, I don't uh, I don't write because I have something to say. I write to understand what I'm thinking, and so very often for me, that's how my poetry starts. I'm 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 intrigued by something. Uh, uh, I want to know more about it. I want to understand what it is I'm thinking about it, and my way of doing that is writing and and. And invariably, that's uh, comes through in poetry. Sure, sure. 
the book itself, you've divided, of, of course, into different segments, uh, you know, new poems and translations, love at middle age, places for a brief a time, uh, mine, um, some uh, birds and beasts, uh, lost <laughs> arts, etc. Um, was there uh, was there a particular reason why you d- decided on these various sections and what do they mean? What what should the 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 reader look for if there's if if anything at all other than you know the yeah thematically I, mean, I tried to group because this was going to be um, a, a book of new poems and selected poems and right. and some translations as well um, it was incorporating work that had been published in other forms either in book form like Fallow Field or online uh, like thirty day poems um, but um, and then the new poems they were kind of thematically all over the place. So for me, I felt like I needed to, um, I needed to organize them. Well, first, first and foremost for myself, but also (laughs) just because I thought it would be better for the reader to, um, to have, uh, you know, kind of distinct um, sections or, or, or markers that would, that would point to, um, uh, to a thematic link between the poems. They, they just sort of naturally fell into those anyway. So uh, I thought, well, why not, why not distinguish them a little bit? And so a number of the new poems came about when I, was, I did this, this wonderfully horrible writing project in 2014, where I was part of a group that a wonderful poet friend of mine in, in the UK, Jo Bell, she started a group called 52, and the idea was to write a poem every week for an entire year. And I signed on to it. And once I signed on to it, I had to, I actually had to write a poem every week. <laughs> that included uh, the week that I got married to my wife, Samantha, and the, uh, our, uh, the week or so that we were on our honeymoon. And uh, you know, anything else that happened in 2014, I was there writing a poem um, uh, every week. And it was a very unusual experience for me because I don't write like that, first of all. And second of all, because it was, the poems were to be written as a result uh, in reaction to prompts that Joe would supply every Thursday, which is again, not a way I write. So, you know, I don't typically think about, you know, what other people are thinking about when I'm writing. It's usually what I'm thinking about. It, It may or may not become interesting to, uh, to the reader <laughs> if, if I've done my job then it's um it, it does become interesting to the reader but it was a very unusual experience um so so a number of the poems in here were the result of prompts that Joe had supplied to the group of us and there were over 500 and I want to say 560 people as a part of this group wow. and it was a private Facebook group and you would post the poem in the private group, uh, you know, after you finished it, and get feedback, which is again not a way I typically work. And so it was a really interesting challenge for me to work that way, to get out of my own head and get out of my own mm-hmm. way of working, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and challenge myself to try a new approach. And it result the result was um, poems along the lines of what what Kathy said in her quote about. Um, uh, our search for meaning in the quotidian. There's a lot of poems in there about everyday experience and everyday concerns. Um, I might read one of them if you if, please. If, please do, please do, like, because I was going to ask you to read a poem. We've been we've been at this for almost a half hour, and we've only read one poem. And I think folks, <laughs> folks are here to listen to your poetry and you're reading it. All right. So this is a poem uh, called "Lost Art," um, and uh, uh, this is was. Um, I don't remember the exact prompt. I should look this up actually, because I'm sure I have them somewhere um, that this was from. But it was uh, it it uh, it took me in a completely different direction from 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 the prompt. I do remember that. But um, so this is called Lost Art. So rare these days to find a firm handshake, one with purpose and power, yet grace and graciousness. Hand coming at you like a plank, straight forward thinking, unself-conscious. You feel it before you touch. This person means business, takes you seriously, acknowledges your presence and value in the world, what used to be called respect. The opposite is notable too, 
flabby fish glad handed over to you by a false friend, or a ha the half shake with its wimpy wink, hand not fully extended or open, resulting in a missed opportunity, like a diver hitting the pool just off center, not being able to read the man behind the hand. Sometimes it's not about the feel of the handshake, rather what isn't felt, an absence that shouts disingenuous at best, or at least feigned indifference. Perhaps that's why of all the lost arts, handwritten letters, well-tied ties, civil discourse, decent air travel, moderate republicanism, I miss the handshake most. And why watching a buffoon performing the clean and jerk as a greeting to every head of state and cabinet nominee, I turn to another lost art and make myself a proper gin martini, bone dry, very, very cold, three olives, shaken, not stirred. Fantastic. It's one of my favorites as well. I, I put a, a couple of remarks. Um, indeed, indeed. And so this was uh, part of that project. I mean, it part was, of that uh, project and completely yeah. different than, than, than most of my work. I mean, it's, it's not a subject I, I would have ordinarily taken up sure. in, in my work. So, but you had a prompt and so you had to kind I had of had a prompt. Follow. So I had to do it. <laughs> I had committed to 52 weeks of writing poems. Sure. And so I did it in the best way that I could. And I, and not all 52 poems survived that experience. I mean, when I went back over them, uh, you know, uh, but, it, but a significant number of them uh, that made it uh, are in this book. So when you write poetry, Scott, is there, um, this is kind of the, the, the everyday question that everybody asks uh, all of the, uh, poets and writers, um, but, I, but I know that folks like to know about this. How, how do you, what's the process? I mean, is it something that, um, do you write mostly every day? Do you, do you prefer writing morning or afternoon? Is there a special place? What, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what circumstances around your life uh, mm -hmm. are, are kind of what you need in order to start your creative work? It is a very interesting question because my life right now is, com is completely disrupted <laughs> by uh, a move. And uh, so I, 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 I haven't really had my writing place. Ah. Um, uh, even, even when I thought I had set it up, we had painters in our new house trying to, you know, uh, they're painting my office now. So I'm not, I had to move everything out of my office into another part. <laughs> so I don't really have a, a place where I'm uh, 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 able to, to sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna write, you know, this is where I do it. But um, I mean, for a long time, because I worked, I worked full time, I had a very, uh, very, um, uh, demanding job. I worked for the Nature Conservancy. I was with the Ernst and Young in their power and utilities group for a while, and clean, working on clean tech projects. And so I had a lot. I I, I had to steal time, you know, uh, and find it late at night. Usually, I would I would work late at night, um, and then um, uh, very very rarely would I ever work in the morning, and and um, uh, sort of prefer to just you know keep keep my writing time for really late at night. I'm talking like, you know, up until one two o'clock in the morning. Um, but that all shifted a few years ago, um, and then I I switched to uh, writing in the mornings, and I I didn't think I was going to be able to do that, as I just don't think of myself as a morning person, more of a night owl. But um, circumstances led me to, to that schedule. And so I adapted, I changed, and now I'm continuing to adapt and change. <laughs> try, to, right. try, to, try to find time to, uh, to, to write uh, where I can at this point. Is there ever a poem that you write and you said, I don't need to rewrite this ever? There's one poem in the book that actually that happened. Um, it's very rare. Um, usually, um, I, I do a lot of, of editing and the revision process is very important for me. I, I, I did a, um, uh, a lecture um, about uh, 20, 20 some odd years ago uh, at the University of Alaska Anchorage, um, a craft talk about the process of revision and, and, and its importance to me. Um, it was also very important to one of my poetry mentors, Donald Hall, and, uh, and also to Elizabeth Bishop. And, um, it was, um, 
Yeah, so that was part of my process was actually the revision would let me get into the poem and 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 understand what it was what was trying to get out of there. And so I I could get the poet out of the way and let the poem speak. Um, but there is one poem in here. It, it's interesting because this book has some um, another aspect of my work that surfaces now and then, but because of the, maybe because of the prompts or maybe because I was taken out of my you know nature poet um, uh, to had to take that hat off for some of those some of those prompts. It it forced me to to let more humor into my work, um, and the poem that. Um, I wrote that really it's probably the only poem in this book that had absolutely no revision to it um, is, um, is a poem called Intelligent Design. And it appeared in my first book, a Fallow Field. And uh, it came about because of uh, knee surgery that I had. So I'll, 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 I'll read that. Please. Don't mind. Intelligent Design. The knee is proof. There's no such thing as intelligent design. If there were, the knee would be much improved rather than in need of replacement. The doctor tells me they are doing wonderful things with technology these days, have improved the joint and bond. Amazing, really. They can take a sheep's tendon and attach it there and here or remove ligaments from one part of the body Secure it by drilling holes and plugging them up, stretching until taut with tension superior to the original. The new designs are so much better. My better is better than your better. It seems obvious. The creator took off the afternoon to play a round of golf, leaving the joint between thigh bone and shin to an intern. Isn't it obvious? I mean, Two million years of evolution haven't approved the knee one whit. Nothing intelligent about it. I wrote that poem sitting in a chair with my leg propped up, not sure when I was going to be able to get back to what I like to do to hike and whatever. I actually had a trip that was a work trip that was planned. I was supposed to go to, um, to India uh in, in like three weeks and i thought i'm never gonna i'm never gonna be able to do this trip you know just like my my knee was in so much pain and i uh, had a lot of recovery ahead of me um and i just started thinking about how how absurd the knee is like the design right. is just so bad <laughs> like, <laughs> and for for what we like to do like you you play basketball you play tennis you play hockey you play whatever sure. you know a sport where you're doing lots of side to side movement and stuff and the knee is just it's just a, a disaster you know running running is just you know just constant just mashing on the knee like why why would why would anybody design that you know you would you would send that back if a designer came to you with that with that you know. <laughs> indeed um you know um we've talked about this and other and and with other poets as well and other writers and and how, of course, you being of, uh, I believe, what, third, fourth generation now? I mean, it was your great-grandfather, right? So that immigrated. Third third generation? Your yeah. Great-grandfather. Yeah. 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 Third, uh, yeah. third generation born here. So with him, yeah. you, you would be fourth in America. But right, third right. generation born here. So in one of the poems that I that I enjoyed, because you kind of gave a different look to it, was Soldad, which is uh, uh, in that uh, segment from your, I believe, your book, right? Um, and the uh, the the book the, from uh, uh, yeah, that was from, from Follow Field. Field. And, mm -hmm. um, and 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 I, you know, I, I was reading that poem. Um, I think I read it uh, lately. It was, it was one of the last ones I read, so probably a couple of days ago. And um, and I said, well, you know, here. Um, so that uh, we Portuguese love the word, we like to say that it's untranslatable and all the kind of stuff that we say. Uh, <laughs> right. And it's unique. It's only in the Portuguese language, like, blah, blah, blah. It, it never rains in California and it's correct, always sunny correct. in Seattle, right? Something yeah. like that, yes. <laughs> and so uh, we, um, you know, but it's been, it's been a theme and it's been a word and it's been a concept 
that ha if there's ever something in the Portuguese uh, uh, literary world that's been overwritten is mm. uh, Saudade from a literary aspect, from a journalistic aspect, from a sociological aspect, many different aspects. Yeah. But you give it a different twist to it. And I like that, that you're Saudade. And it, and it just tells me a little bit from my reading it is that so there are these elements that are Portuguese but people who are of second, third, and fourth generation just see them a little bit different than me mm. who immigrated. And that's what this poem brought to me. It brought mm. to me, you know, the, 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 the relationship I have with Saudad and the relationship that you have with Saudad, mm. which is different, which will be the relationship that my grandchildren, you know, will have with Saudad or already right, do in right. some aspects. But it's all the same thing, you know, so I don't know if I'm making sense, but that's what your yeah. poem brought to me. It's, it's just like this full circle of this, of this concept that is Portuguese and someone who's third generation has a different take on it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you yeah. want to. If you want to read it for us, or I'd if be you, happy to. I'd be I, happy we, to. I'd love, to, I'd love to. I'd love to have folks hear it because I, yeah. I looked at it, I read it, you know, fastly, and then I went back to it and I said, "Wow, this is a refreshing way to look at Sodad, and this is, uh, this is, this is uh, indicative of how everything can be full circle." Thank you, thank you. Well, this 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 poem was actually written um, around the time when I was first really trying to understand my Portuguese roots. So this would have been around 1994. Uh, probably 94, 95, when my and my grandfather uh, had just had just passed away, and so all of the family history was went went to him went with him to his grave, and uh, I lost the opportunity to get that firsthand uh, the stories that 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 he took with him, and I was trying to understand this word. What does it mean? Like, you know, and I'd heard it was untranslatable and it was, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole thing. And I was thinking about it in the context of what I, what I was starting to understand. And again, trying to think about what I'm, right about what I'm thinking, understand what I'm thinking. Saudad. And as a epigraph from Pessoa, which I had also translated, I feel beliefs that I do not hold. I am ravished by pas passions I repudiate. Which also has... I think a deep connection to the word because I think that there's a we you know one thing I've understood is that people, we we do have a complicated relationship with the word. <laughs> Indeed, we are surrounded by people who sentimentalize collegiate life, swoon over first marriages, or live in days gone by. The Portuguese have a word for it, saudade, a longing for lost things. For myself. I have fond memories of houses in New England where my childhood blossomed, disappeared, of a life of the mind. But what I long for is the old cherry tree in front of our home. We were newly wed, how it dashed its branches against our roof. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. It's really a unique way to look at Sodad. It's a it's a it's a different. I would never think of of. I can't write poetry, but I would never think of writing a prose piece on Sodad the way you know with all of these thought process in it. But it just it just tell it just reinforces in me um, some of the things that we all have talked about in different aspects when we talk about identity, mm -hmm. um, especially passing on from second, third, and fourth generations. And we have you know some friends of ours who are uh, with us uh, on, on the Zoom uh, parts and they're you know, poets who, uh, like you, uh, maybe of second, third, fourth, and fifth generation. But uh, I, I'm always, I, I'm always uh, surprised. And I think this is a fresh way to look at Sodat, a fresh and appealing and very intelligent way to look at Sodat. And, uh, and it reminds me that one phrase that, um, that, uh, that our friend uh, Christophan, the, the singer songwriter who you mm -hmm. brought uh, last uh, year to us here on a, an event that we had to, to launch the Kagahu Colloquium. Uh, and uh, that he said, are you sure you guys have not been to the Azores multiple <laughs> times because you're writing about things that uh, are very dear to our hearts. And so it's, it's interesting, even though you were trying to connect with this part of your, of your uh, heritage that you knew very little about because your grandfather unfortunately had taken the stories to the grave and that, that's happened with so many families yet uh, you were able to connect so uh, it's wonderful um, one of the sections of the book interesting is, thing about this was uh, was when I first went to the, to the source 
And I met with Vimberto Freitas. I gave him a copy of the book, Fell the Field, uh -huh. where this poem appears. And he opened right to that poem. Uh, I don't know how he did it, but he just, when he opened the book, he was sitting, we were sitting in this cafe and he, he opened it right to this poem and he read it. And then later that evening, he did a presentation at the Biblioteca and um, he pulls out my book and he says, I want to read you. Uh, this is the poem by a Portuguese American, an Azorian American. Um, and it's the, it's the best uh, definition of Sadat that I've ever read. And I was just, <laughs> I was sitting there, in, 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 you know, in, in the, in the library, just like, what? He's <laughs> incredibly well, it, generous of it, him to say that. But it uh, is, it is, a, it is a phenomenal description. And, 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 and so, and, um, I would say it's an updated version of what <laughs> other people have done sure, or yeah. have tried to do. And so, uh, I think it's, I, I think it's right on. On the, in the book, you have also uh, put a uh, you have uh, a a section on a translated work. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about these are works that you've translated. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but from Portuguese to English, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, and I that um, again, sort of like the process with poetry. I'm trying to understand what I'm thinking um, with with translation. And reading, trying to read poetry in the original language, especially with Portuguese, I've been trying to, but I also did that with, with German and French, um, trying to understand the language. Mm -hmm. um, reading poetry in the original language uh, helps me understand the language because I know how poetry works and I know what, what, how language works in a poem. And so when I see a poet doing something with the language in a poem, I can understand more the nuances of the language. And so that's really, I think, helped, um, helped my uh, self-education, if you will, of, uh, of, of trying, trying to learn Portuguese, which I've been trying to learn since, you know, the early to mid nineties. So uh, I'm still not, 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 um, you just, not, you not just need to, be. you just need to live in San Miguel for a I year and, then, just, and yeah. then you'll, and then you'll be, <laughs> and then you'll, you will be fluent completely. I had fluent. a wonderful tutor who was teaching me how to speak slang in, in Azorian slang, which was just phen phenomenal. So. <laughs> Well, you'll, you'll learn both when you're in San Miguel for, for a whole full year. Uh, are there specific uh, themes or are there specific writers uh, or poets that you that make you want to translate them when you're reading them or 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 how? Because you have a, you have a, a, a good mix of, 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 of poets that you translated, uh, you know, from Fernando Pessoa, which everybody, you know, likes to translate because he's so is so deep and so and so of course uh, and so multifaceted but um you have Angela Almeida you have uh, a couple other poets as well and so um is there a particular uh, way that you look at uh, at uh, this work and you say as you're reading because you you as you mentioned you were reading in order to also understand more of the language because you know how mm -hmm. poetry works mm -hmm. and so uh when do you decide or how do you decide or is there a process that you decide i'd like to translate this yeah well with the pessoa it was um i mean it, when i first it was uh, richard zenith uh mm -hmm. came came to the states in 94 and spoke at poets house in new york and brought along with him uh nuno judice and and uh judice and um and uh, pedro tom and and uh I, so i so i got to meet you know Richard, who was who was translating Pessoa very early on in you know in 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 his translation life, I guess um, some of the first books that he had done were Pessoa, and so they were talking about Pessoa. And then two contemporary Portuguese poets who were real live, you know, and um, and 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 right there, you know, and so and I I, I stayed in contact with with Nuno. We've been we've we've seen each other a few times and. Um, uh, uh, he actually uh, had um, commissioned uh, translation of several of my poems from my book Dwelling uh, for, for magazine he edits for the Gobenkin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, so I started way back when with the Pessoa. And then um, the Nemesio really came about because 
I was doing some research for a, a, a nonfiction book that I'm writing, a memoir about my journey to, un, to, to discover uh, my, my, my roots and my identity and what it means to my identity. And um, I, was, I turned to Nemesio, you know, to, to uh, in, in particular, the Corsario uh, das Yilash, um, to sort of understand his perspective on the islands and, you know, get some of the local color, if you will. And, um, but there was no translation of that book into English. And so I had to try to read it in, in, in Portuguese, which I, I was doing. And I, I think I did pretty well with it. And then I started looking at his poetry as well. Um, and it was Onesimo uh, Almeida who, uh, you know, as, as he does with many things, um, uh, tricked me into, uh, into translating in Mezio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when it, I, I, it was a good trick. It was a good. I trick. just happened to ask him, "Well, has this book ever been translated into English?" And he said, "No, but would you like to try?" <laughs> Knowing full well that I would, you know, have to take him up on that challenge. So, so I turned to Nemesius' poetry because I really wanted to understand. Uh, you know, the, his language can be very complicated. Uh, his usages can be archaic in some in some instances. I mean. Uh, and he mixes in Spanish and French and German and a little bit of English that he knew and he sometimes gets that wrong. But um, it was through his poetry I really started to understand who, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. he was and his sensibility. So that helped me when I started to translate the Cusario that it was, uh, it really helped me have a grounding in, in his poetry just to understand his sensibility. And I, I knew what he, was, what he was doing in some of these poems. And so, um, I read one? <laughs> so yeah, I was going to ask you, can you read one from 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 the Mezu? Um, because uh, I, uh, I I would ask you to read uh, uh, Pessoa, but it's a longer poem. That's a I, long one, yeah. And, and before you read the Mezu, uh, what 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 inspires you to do the tobacco shop? Because that's one of his, of course, iconic well, poems. But it's so long. It's um, it's yeah. So uh, I had tra yeah. originally translated just a brief section of it, um, uh -huh. the first section. Uh, you know, the first four lines I had translated. And um, uh, uh, Pessoa Plural, um, wonderful journal that comes out of uh, Brown University, uh, asked me to do an essay um, uh, and, um, and wanted some, some of my translations of Pessoa and they wanted a couple of, a couple of my, my own poems. And when I submitted this brief section of Tobacco Shop along with uh, the other poem, which I, I absolutely love, and I don't think it's as well known, Only Nature is Divine. Um, obviously, I would love that poem. But um, so I, when I submitted it, the editor, uh, <laughs> uh, Jerome Pizarro, said, well, I, this is a nice start, but, you know, that poem is, is you know, 300 lines or something like that. Uh, why don't you translate the rest of it and then send it back? <laughs> and I was like... No, 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 no. I really didn't want to do that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, it was a challenge. And whenever I'm challenged, that I got from my grandfather, who sure, told me sure. I, could, I was too small to be a defenseman in hockey. And um, although he was, he was like 4'11", four, four and so I was towering <laughs> over him as a child anyway. But, um, yeah, it was sort of like, okay, well, I'm going to be the best defenseman you ever saw, you know? <laughs> So <laughs> you have uh, actually five poems from uh, Vitrine de Mezu, and uh, which one are you going to share with us? I would like to read um, Ship. Ah, that's a very, yeah, and excellent, excellent. And all, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one of the one of the changes that I made here um, at, towards, towards the end okay. um, to, to try to bring it to, to life a little bit. Ship. My flesh is sore from the landing of some birds. I don't know where they're from. I only know that they, like life, sting in my heart. When they come, they come softly. Leaving, they go so heavy. How I like to be here at my window, giving my mind over to the birds. I'm looking at the sea. Look at that aimless ship and seeing it, give it a lamp, or my sad eyelashes, the bird and the ship, in a nutshell, here at my window. 
Wonderful. So the, 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 the word, the, I use lamp um, mm -hmm. rather than candle or sail, which, which Vela can also be translated as, because for me, it echoed the, the lighting of a lamp to draw a wayfarer you know, uh, home. You know, right, right. Uh, when they're at sea and you see the lamp and that's where you, you know, you're heading in that direction, you're heading to the, leave the light on, you know, um, for the weary traveler. And I always, but I, I did think about, I wrestled with, you know, maybe it could be give us, give it a sign or give it a salute, um, you know, that although technically not accurate would also work. Um, uh, so anyway, also lamp tied for me, to something I got from Corsario where Nemesio was talking about how he, he desires to be um, a lighthouse keeper. And he <laughs> thought, he thought, oh, what, to, what, a, what a gift that would be to just like become a lighthouse keeper and just stay here on this island as the lighthouse keeper and take care of the light. And so I, that made me think, well, lamp makes, makes the most sense because uh, that's what you, he would do from, uh, from the top of the lighthouse. And that's all the nuances that one has to play with or work with or more than play with mm. when one is translating the poetry. Mm. That's uh, very wise. And uh, thanks for doing that, because that's a very conscientious uh, uh, translator. Um, we're almost about uh, out of time. Um, uh, this hour just flew by. It's so fast. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> unbelievable. I wanted to, before we uh, do anything else, I wanted to uh, once again uh, share with those who are watching us uh, your your website where people can order uh, the, the the book Wine Dark Sea, uh, Scott Edward Anderson, as you can see it right there. Uh, you can order directly from the uh, from the publisher. You can order from Amazon a Bookshop, and so um, there's uh, several ways there. And again, it's just basically Scott's name. If you if you just go ahead and Google that, it'll give you uh, Scott Edward Anderson. And um, you all, you could also go, of course, and hear, get a little bit more information about Scott. There's a wonderful uh, uh, bio, and uh, also you know some information about all of the other books. Again, the book is Wine Dark Sea, Scott Edward Anderson. It's new and selected poems and uh, translation. You can read a little bit more of what folks have said about the book. Um, and it, it is a wonderful book. It's a book that uh, you're going to treasure for many, many years. And you're going to want to reread it. Uh, trust me. I mean, uh, I, uh, I love poetry. I consider myself a reader of poetry. I'm not a poet by any uh, stretch of any imagination possible and impossible, but, um, but I, but it is, it is important to me. It's actually a very important part of my life. I read poetry mm -hmm. every day, uh, whether it's just one or two or three. And, um, and I've read the book and I've reread quite a few of the poems and will continue to do so in order to try to understand some of them. And, uh, and, uh, and I love it when I love the language, but don't understand what you're trying to say, because then I want to read it again. I think I understand, mm -hmm. but maybe I don't, you know, so um, it's, a, it's, it's that kind of a, it's that kind of a book. Um, I wanted to um, uh, end with you reading one of your poems and I'm, I don't know if I should ask you to do this one, but it's one of my favorites. So you may, you may <laughs> well, which, uh, is, of course. which is, which is more than peace because I think it's, oh. very, it's very powerful and I think it's very important. Uh, what do you think? Or is that, I'm, not something I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. I was, yeah. uh, Samantha was trying to um, get me to read my Portuguese poem that's in the book, but I did that oh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, I'm happy to get out of that. Ah, I... <laughs> well, we can, we can do both. We can do both. We can do both. We can do Samantha's first. <laughs> or this one first and, Samantha, and what Samantha was uh, was doing. But more than peace, uh, if you want to read it. If you don't, you uh, I, it's up to you. I know. I'm happy to read it. I'm happy you're, to read you're, it. You're the guest of yeah. honor. And I think it's a wonderful poem. And it's such an important uh, for, for today's world for us to think about. Yeah, especially given the situation going on with the Ukraine. And um, actually, I shouldn't say the Ukraine, it's Ukraine. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been corrected on that a couple of times. But, you know, I'm, I grew up playing Risk, so it's always the Ukraine to me. But right. <laughs> more than peace. Peace takes many forms, wholeness, fullness, and completion, integrity, healing, and harmony, loving, and being loved forgiveness and reconciliation, a ceasing of fire, of strife, of anxiety. Peace is not just an absence of war. It is also being safe from fear. 
a tuneful sound, shalom, is to be in harmony, in well-being, restored in right relationship, human to God, God to human. Yet peace, which we all strive for, eludes us and can seem ever distant, although we all share one simple rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. We end up doing unto others as we would never have done unto us. We rarely love our neighbors as ourselves. We let refugees wash up on shore, ignore their entreaties with our refusal, and elect people who ignore commandments they think don't apply to them. Still, we are human. We do the best we can. We are capable of great pity, empathy, resistance. Shalom means more than peace. It means we still have a chance, as long as we breathe, to seek peace in others and ourselves. Tranquility is an act of persistence, soundness of a bell in tune, ringing throughout all our days, even as mountains fall and hills shake, righteousness and peace shall kiss each other. Wonderful, wonderful poem. Uh, very, very powerful. Um, very well done. Very musical. Uh, very wonderful. And now, Samantha's favorite. <laughs> oh, you've just made her evening. Well, we have to end with but Samantha's I'm, favorite. I'm hoping that, uh, okay, well, uh, so this and Portuguese, tell us, speak, speaking Portuguese is still a challenge for me. Okay, so which poem is it? it? It's a poem that you wrote in Portuguese? Or yeah, you, so well, I, wrote it, I wrote it in English first. Uh -huh. uh, it was a poem I wrote for um, my Sorian publisher, well, yours, yours as well, Letra Slavadish, mm -hmm. uh, did an anthology for International Women's Day last year. Yes, um, I recall. And I, they asked me to, to, to contribute a poem. So I wrote a poem in English, but then I realized, you know, it really has to be in Portuguese because it doesn't make any sense to, to have my poem you know, as like the only English poem in the, in the book. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll try my hand at translating it into Portuguese and uh, see, how, see how it comes. And uh, this is the result. Wonderful. And I'm not in, I have not practiced this, so I'm gonna- That's okay, I, well, that, you're sure not gonna, supposed to- I'm sure I'm not, gonna butcher it. You're, so not, supposed, to you're not supposed to practice when you're creating with language and when you're, <laughs> and when you're talking, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna say, well, I'm gonna go out and now I'm, let me practice what I'm gonna say to my next door neighbor. No, it just comes naturally. So that's uh, cool okay. for Samantha for, for doing that. Okay, okay. <sighs> my wine dark sea here. There you go, yeah. Prepare you for it. A outra metade do seio, seja cinzento, coberto de nuvens, o azul safira claro, abraçado pelos dedos cor de rosa de dawn. O em chamas como um sol ardente por se. Si. Espelhado no mar e o longo de uma costa ro, 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 rocosa. O contrastante no seio brilhantíssimo, a outra metade do seio lidera com empatia e graça, sempre crescendo, mudando, desafiando ela própria e os outros que rodeiam. Se conseguir acompanhá-la, um papagueio no ar, no ar, tremulando-se em seu vento, estás na boleia da tua vida. Se conseguir apanhá-la, uma borboleta a dançar, flor a flor, deve largar a sua preciosa vida. Right. Very good. I don't a, know. A do céu. I love that. <laughs> and and I love the, the line. And in Portuguese, it sounds so much better. A borboleta dançar de flora em flor. I mean, that sounds much better than English. Okay. It so does. Samantha's right. The Portuguese does have a, a romantic <laughs> and a very, um, there are some things in, in Portuguese that sound better. And that one, a outra metade do céu, sound, does sound better in Portuguese than in English, indeed. 
Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you who have been following us. So the book again is called Wine Dark Sea. It is uh, Scott Edward Anderson, new and selected poems and translations. If you need to get more information about how to get it, we've shared, but if you need it, uh, please get a hold of me at, through PBBI, and I'll be more than happy uh, to link you up with uh, the sites that you need to get the book. It is um, it is indeed a, an important book in the Portuguese American community and all communities and all people who love poetry will certainly, certainly love this book as well. Wine Dark Sea, Scott Edward Anderson, on behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBBI Fresno State. Thank you, Scott, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you. Boa tarde. Boa tarde. Obrigado.